Uh, thank you everyone for joining me for the webinar today. Welcome everyone with another informative workshop by SAR Education. And SAR has been continuously supporting all the teaching fraternity now and forever. And I'm Shafali Janeja. I am the moderator for the workshop today. Before we begin, I would like to share a few norms of the session. Right now, we will keep everyone on mute to avoid any background noises that may distract you from listening to the speaker. We will have a slot of 15 minutes towards the end of the session so that you may ask your questions. Please keep a note of your questions with you. And then probably when we have the question and answer slot, we can ask the questions. Thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, now, I take the opportunity to welcome Sarah again with us. Sarah Vernum is a primary elementary school teacher at Woodslow Primary School in England. She has developed Jolly Phonics with Sue Loy, and she's the author for Jolly Grammar 2. So let's understand grammar the jolly way. Over <laughs> to you, Sarah. Thank you very much for that very nice uh, introduction there. Um, yes, uh, we're going to look at sort of the next stage up from um, the uh, introductory, the, the, the Jolly Phonics handbook level uh, and where we go from there. Because obviously one year is not uh, a complete program uh, and the children have still got quite a few years left in school that we need to fill and quite a lot of uh, skills and knowledge that they need to uh, understand. So my um, talk this morning is going to be, let me just get on my screen. I love it when it works, it makes life so much easier. It's going to get my screen up there. Uh, and we are going to be looking uh, mostly at grammar one and two, but as in all the things uh, that we do and in all good learning programs, to be honest, there is quite a lot of overlap and revision uh, and, and repetition in a way, but that actually is how children learn by constantly giving them new things and not revising and building on what they've done before. It doesn't actually make um, for a good program or that the children will learn uh, particularly well. The very bright ones might, but the majority of them do need to, to come back and to revisit subjects and then to have a little nibble more uh, and, and move them forward in their learning. So I always tell people that the reason for using our program, Jolly Phonics and Jolly Grammar, um, the two phrases, Jolly Phonics and Jolly Grammar are a bit interchangeable. Uh, Jolly Phonics is actually the overarching program, although in some times it's often particularly referring to uh, the first year only, but in fact, all the way through, we are Jolly Phonics. Uh, it's just that we're adding more things in and it gets called Jolly Grammar from uh, year one or the, the second year of the program upwards. And the reasons for using us, one of the things is, particularly if you are teaching uh, as a foreign or additional language, is that because we teach through the sounds and we teach the children to make the sounds, that you end up with a good accent, okay? Uh, so nothing wrong with having an accent at all, but the, the, uh, the, the better and the more natural the accent, then you know, you're considered to be a better speaker of the language. Uh, because we look at grammar and um, you know, the parts of speech and all that sort of thing, you end up with a very wide vocabulary. And the reason I've put not just nouns underneath is because um, many uh, programs that teach a language, what they do is, when I was at school, this was how we were taught, you know, they take a theme like uh, the sitting room uh, and you learn to say the armchair or the table or the light. So you get a lot of nouns, a lot of things that you can point to, but actually putting them together to make a sentence, you don't do. Or you only get a very limited sentence, like I can see a chair, I can see a table, which is all very well being able to say that, but it's not really scintillating conversation if you're talking to someone. So 
we introduce a very wide range of, of words and, and using the words um, so that they become a master of the language, not just um, a user of it. And I say we're very greedy uh, because, again, we want children not just to be able to speak it, not just to be able to read it, uh, but to be able to read, write and speak it. Because again, you, you do quite often come across, I mean, I can, I can stagger my way through, um, you know, a piece of French, written French. Uh, but to be honest, I couldn't have a conversation and uh, speak. So we, we want the whole package. We want the whole, we want them to be able to read it. We want them to be able to write it. And we want them to be able to speak confidently uh, in, in the language. Now, as I say, from the second year of the programme on, which is grammar one, which is slightly confusing. OK, all of the books have the same strap line. OK, and it is handbooks for teaching spelling, grammar, spelling and punctuation. OK, and actually those three words, grammar, spelling and punctuation is what we do. And I think that we are one of the few or only uh, programs that do actually teach in this way where where we um, overlap and show the links between all of them because although in a way they are all separate subjects grammar spelling and punctuation actually they are all overlapping and and link in with each other in lots of different ways some of which hopefully I will point out and explain this morning but that's why our programme teaches them together. We do have separate strands. So we have some lessons that are labelled spelling and some that are labelled grammar. Uh, but in fact, the, the two overlap quite a lot, as we shall see. OK. The word it's is often spelled wrongly in uh, English by English people. <coughs> Whether they put an apostrophe in is sometimes a bit of a lottery. It's like, shall I put an apostrophe? Shall I not? Yes, because they don't understand the rule. OK, now English is terrible for rules. We don't like them. They apply some of the time, most of the time, occasionally all of the time when we're lucky. This actually is one of the rules where it is all of the time uh, because what confuses people is that we have an apostrophe S for belonging. So bees umbrella, okay? So we would put an apostrophe there because it shows belonging. So, so people tend to get confused, but this rule actually is very easy. And if you know your grammar, this will help your spelling. So it is actually the default way of spelling it. If you're not sure, that's probably the best uh, one to go for and don't put the apostrophe in. It's actually very simple to know when the apostrophe comes because it's short for it is, it's a verb, it's part of the verb. It is, that apostrophe isn't showing belonging, it's showing there's a letter missing. But they say, if you know it's a verb, if you know you can substitute it is, then you know to put that apostrophe in, okay? So the two sides are coming together to show or to help you in the very complex um, rules that, that, that that the English language is mostly governed by, okay? Again, same with things like um, adding uh, suffixes at the end. For um, verbs, the tenses, the past, the regular past tense is shown by the suffix ed. We put that um, ed on the end of a word. Okay, that shows the tense, but actually, there are four different spelling rules that go with that. It sounds very simple, doesn't it? Oh, past tense, we just add ed. No problem. But there are four spelling rules that we need that go with that. So again, it's immediately clear that there is this, this overlap and joining. Now, if we're lucky, okay, we just add the ed like in cheered, okay? If we've got a word like hope, which has already got a vowel on the end, in this case, it does happen to be another E, but it's already got a vowel on the end. Actually, we don't want two, two E's stuck on the end. So we drop one E and add the ED, so we get hoped. 
We also have that um, Y at the end there. The Y is there, which you should know if you've done uh, the first year of the course. The Y is actually, although it makes an E sound, it's actually Y is a cousin of an, an I, an I, I. And actually, if you go to places like Scotland, up in the north in the UK, they will say hurry, e. they won't say hurry, like, like us southerners do. Okay. Uh, because the letter I doesn't like being on the end of a word. But when we've put the suffix on, of course, it's no longer at the end. So that I, that I comes back. Okay. And then... <clears throat> Our magic E or hop over E or um, split digraph E, there isn't an accepted, they're all, they're all accepted terms for the same thing, okay? They just mean it's the same thing. Um, but the, um, the magic, the influence of a vowel can go back and change the sound of the previous vowel if there's one letter in between. So if we just put the ED on that hop, it would be the same word as the one above it. It would be the same word as here. It would be hoped, which isn't what we want at all. But the magic, the influence can't hop over two letters. So we double the consonant after a short vowel. So we can have hopped, not hoped, okay? So as I say, that's really why we, we, we teach in a, a sort of holistic approach because there is all this, uh, th this crossover. Uh, and then, you know, these rules apply to other things, again, as we'll see as we go through uh, this morning. But, but um, the, whole, the whole of the language, the, the grammar, the spelling, the punctuation, you know, comes together to be what makes the children uh, successful users of the English language. Uh, now, as I hope you know, uh, Jolly Phonics is a systematic synthetic phonics program, right? Phonics is to do with sound. Systematic is easy. It means you build up a little bit at a time. Okay. And again, that goes throughout our course. It doesn't matter whether it's the first year, whether it's the grammar, whether it's punctuation, whatever it is, we build up a little bit at a time, uh, building on the knowledge that the children already know, and then adding a bit more which again is sometimes why our course is slightly different to um, some of the other programs that are out there, uh, because we do actually think, right, this is what the children know. What do they need to know next in order to achieve and get to the next level of understanding that they need to do? So they're fine. Synthetic is a word I always have trouble with because for me, synthetic always meant sort of man-made plastic, synthetic cream not the nice real cream that you get in a cake. It's a sort of one you bite into and think, oh dear, that's a bit disappointing, isn't it? So I looked it up in the dictionary because I'm a teacher, that's what you do. And I got this definition made by synthesis. And I thought, that's not very good, is it? It doesn't tell me anything at all because I still don't know what it means. So anyway, not to be deterred, I look up the word synthesis. And I finally get a meaning, the combining and the putting together and the building up of elements. And at that point you think, aha, yes, it does apply. Okay, so just like in the first year, we are combining and putting together the sounds to make the words and taking them apart again in order to spell them. Um, we are doing exactly the same thing with our grammar. OK, um, and by grammar, again, I am taking as a holistic term of, of, of the grammar, the spelling and the punctuation. We are building it up a little bit at a time, giving the children the information that they need and that will help them uh, as, as they go on their uh, learning journey. Now, grammar one uh, is only the start of our course. We have six levels. Um, which will take the children in, in English schools through to um, age 11, uh, where they finish their primary education and go on to um, secondary. By the time you get up to grammar six, 
it is really quite complex grammar. Uh, and in fact, I have people sometimes that haven't really done a lot of grammar with their children, or in fact, it wasn't taught particularly in schools in the UK for quite a long time. It was out of fashion. Um, you know, oh, you don't need to know that, do you? Uh, so I have teachers sometimes open the, the uh, grammar five to six book and think, oh, I don't understand this. I didn't do this at school, okay? But because the children, as I say, go through it very carefully and slowly, systematically building up their knowledge, they have no problem with it whatsoever, okay? Neither uh, do the teachers who have actually, you know, worked, worked through the program uh, and understand it. So uh, a little word of warning, don't think that just because, for example, you've got um, a year five class, you can open the grammar five book and think, I'll just jump in and start here because there are things that need uh, to be known both by the teacher uh, and the child. Uh, as you can see here, they've all got two, uh, two forms. They have a split personality. So there's a handbook and there's a pupil book, okay? They look slightly different, but they have exactly the same information in them, okay? It's just a different way of presenting it. Uh, we traditionally, or we originally started with the photocopyable handbooks, some people didn't like that particularly, you know, they didn't like having lots of piles of paper uh, that looked, um, you know, a bit scrappy sometimes. Uh, and they wanted to have it in a bound book with a bit of colour and things, which is what we did. So that's why that's the difference between them. It is up to you to choose which one you want to teach with. OK, and again, the pace of your teaching will depend on. Um, the level of ability of your children and the amount of time that you have. Um, you know, if if you've only got your children for an hour a week, then you're not going to go as fast as someone who has them five days, you know, an hour every day for a week. And again, that is something that the teacher has to judge which which bits um, they need to concentrate on, which bits perhaps don't need so much concentrating on and how fast you go through the scheme, um, you know, because it is obvious, it's logical. You cannot do um, everything if you've got them for a very small amount of time. But I know people who teach it, as they say, for an hour a week. I know people who teach it every day and they all still get uh, results. Now, the front of the handbook um, tells you what you need to know. It's always a good thing to read. Uh, but in order to start with grammar one, what the children should know is that the basic 42 letter sounds uh, that are, are taught within the uh, Jolly Phonics, the first year of the scheme, and one way to write each of them. They should know how to blend regular words using those 42 sounds, how to sound out regular words using those 42 sounds. Some tricky words, mostly for reading, they are harder for writing, mostly for reading. Some of them will, will be able to spell them, but you no, know, some tricky words, because without them, we can't have sentences. And they should also have been introduced to some alternative spellings. Okay, so all of this is within the first year of the course. On the left hand side in black are the digraphs, uh, the alternative vowel digraphs that we introduce the sound with. Because we start off by introducing it in one way, okay? And then as the children learn, we introduce the other ways the, um, the, 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 the sounds can be spelled. Because English is one of those languages, as I say, that's very complex. Um, we have multiple ways of writing sounds. We have multiple ways of spelling sounds. <laughs> so we say introduce them and we expect this is what the children um, will be familiar with and have seen before we start on the grammar course. Okay, as I say, um, the front of the handbook or the teacher's book has lots and lots of information in it, as we'll see shortly. And there is one of these for each level that accompanies each pupil book. OK, so 
there's lots of information and support uh, there for you. Um, we also have, only for Grammar 1 at the moment, some workbooks. These are quite good if you um, have a child who is perhaps learning uh, Jolly Phonic somewhere else or that you want to send for home. Again, they, they cover the same ground, but in a slightly different way. So it looks slightly different, uh, but it's good for extra support or perhaps as I say, for some homework with the children. And these are some pages with it. So the same sort of thing, but say presented in different ways to help the children um, learn. So as I say, although, we teach holistically, we teach grammar, spelling and punctuation. There are two sorts of lessons. We say we have one grammar lesson a week and one spelling lesson a week. So although I'm going to show the links, I'm actually going to look at them in the two strands because it's slightly easier that way. Uh, and I'm going to start off with the spelling strand. Um, you know, why, why is it important to spell properly? Well, one, because it's correct. Uh, two, um, you know, I often have people say to me, oh, yeah, we've got computers and spell check and uh, all this sort of thing. Um, but actually, you still need to make a plausible attempt at the spelling in order for the spell checker to find the word you need. It's very easy. Um, you know, you, you, you'll get the wrong word. Uh, I'm sure, like myself, we've all sent messages that we've then read back and thought, whoops, that's not what I meant, that's not the word I meant. Okay, uh, and also, again, you know, because if, if the computer has chosen a word, you do need to know that word and check it means the right thing, otherwise you could end up saying something you don't mean to by mistake. Okay, and the other thing these days, of course, is not just spell checking, but things like Google Translate. Okay, again, same, same principles. You need to know that Google Translate has translated it as you would like it to. Um, my husband teaches at a, a boarding school which has um, a lot of foreign students at it. Uh, and they have a, a Chinese lad who has come over and joined them this, this term, who has very little English, but he has, I'm not sure what it is, a, some sort of, gadget that he holds up, it's not like his phone, uh, and it translates. Um, having heard some of the translations, some of them are slightly iffy, I would, I would say. Um, you definitely really should learn the language. The other thing about it is, because he has this and he relies on it, his impetus to learn English isn't as strong as it would be if he didn't have it, okay? Which is quite interesting. Uh, because he's doing all the translating for him, he doesn't need to learn, um, which was something we hadn't sort of thought about or considered. But so it is important that you know uh, the words that are being used on your behalf are the ones that you want to know, which is why we need to learn how to, to spell and recognize words. As I say, English is complex. English is not regular. It has rules that apply sometimes. Uh, we are, um, it's basically Germanic in, in structure. We started off with the Anglo-Saxons. Um, and we were invaded in 1066, so quite a long time ago, by the Normans, by the French. Uh, and the two languages, Anglo-Saxon and Norman French, melded into each other which is why we have a cow as an animal, which the Anglo-Saxons who were conquered look after. Okay, but the posh people, the nobles were the Norman French, which is why we eat beef when it comes to the table, like the French word boeuf, okay? Uh, so it was two different languages at one point. Over the years, it's melded in. Uh, we have then been around the world, to places like India, uh, and we've decided, oh, bungalow, that's a nice word. We'll have that. Chutney. Yeah, great. Yeah. Bikini. Yeah. Yeah, fine. Uh, and we've taken them all in and we've taken them all in with their spellings as well. We haven't regularized them. We've just taken them in. OK, so phonemes, which is a, a fancy word for sounds, can be represented by graphemes, spellings, 
which can have one, two, three, or even four letters. Okay, the k in cat, the sh, the digraphs, the igh is trigraph. So we've got three letters, and we've even got some which have got four. Okay, we can have a sound can have more than one way of being spelt. So all of those, the a i a y a hop over a, they all say a when they come in a word. Okay. So I think that's eight, one, two, three, four, four, or seven. Okay. Different ways that A can be said. Some only come in one word, two words. Okay. But the children need to be able to cope with all of them. And the uh, spellings have more than one sound. Uh, so the CH, you can say ch, which is a good old Anglo Saxon way. Uh, if it comes in a word like choir, which we've borrowed from Greek, it says k. Uh, and if it's a word like chalet, which we brought in from French, it says shh. Okay, so it's very complex for the children to learn, which is why we say, right, we start with one way. We get the children to understand that one way. And then we introduce the other ways as we go. Because you can imagine, if we throw all these things onto them, they will be completely confused. Okay, one way, make sure they understand it, then move them on to the other ways. If you go on to the Jolly Learning Resources section on the uh, website, they have um, a complete code. You can download um, this, uh, and this tells you all the different ways that the sounds can be made. The green ones on the left are the ones that are introduced first of all. The pink are the alternatives introduced, uh, and the white ones are the, the more... Um, the more unusual ones that, that come later on. Not so good for children, not unless they're much older, but, but quite interesting and helpful uh, for teachers because then you can sort of get an, uh, uh, an overview. But what we need to do is help the children to navigate through <laughs> this terrible maze that is the English language. So, how do we do that? Spelling strategies, right, I'm going to give you just a couple of seconds, not too long, because nobody wants to sit and look at a, a blank silent screen. Can you think of a few ways that you use in order to spell a word? If you wanted to spell a word, uh, what, what strategies might you use? So say just, just a couple of ideas, jot them down. I can't see the chat box, but you can put them in the chat box if you want to for others to see. Sometimes I actually make people spell a word, but I won't do that this morning. Right. So you might have written some of these down. I see the word inside my head. Okay, that's great. You know how to spell the word. You see it inside your head, you can just copy it down, but you need to know the word first and have a really good memory in order to do that. And in order to be able to memorize the number of words that, that you need. I just know it, bully for you. I link it to other words that are related to it. So, you know, hat, cat, rat, mat, all that sort of thing, which again is fine. But again, you need to know all those words to start with. Uh, and what they call this is analogy. Uh, and there is uh, a piece of research somewhere uh, that says that actually you need to have a reading age of about seven or above in order to be able to use analogy and have enough words to make it worthwhile. I know spelling rules. That is good, and we do teach spelling rules, but as I've already pointed out, in English, they're not that reliable. You need to know them, but you also need to know the exceptions. Uh, I break the words uh, down into bits. I write a list of possible spellings and choose the one I think looks right. We all do that, yeah, you know that one. Uh, and I listen to sounds and record symbols for the sounds. Okay, all of these are, are perfectly legitimate uh, strategies for spelling, but the ones on the right-hand side of the screen are the important ones. 
they are the ones that will um, help your children to become independent spellers, writers, uh, and readers to a certain extent, um, because they are the ones who know what they're doing. Okay, you listen for the sound and record the symbol. That's your first strategy. Okay, but when you come to the alternatives, I write a list of possible spellings, okay? And you look at them and you choose the one that, that looks right or you check it with a dictionary, okay? If you're, you're still not sure. Again, you need to know, okay, is it AI, AY, hop over E? You need to know what those possibilities are before you can start writing them down. And then breaking the words into bits, into syllables, you know, for, for small words, sounding them out is great. But once you get a big long word, then you need to start breaking it down into manageable small pieces. Okay. Right. So in grammar one, uh, on the spelling side, we go over the digraphs that they taught originally. Okay. In the, in the basic 42. Uh, digraphs, they're not more difficult really, but children do find them more difficult and adults often find them more difficult. Although, uh, as I quite often say, you don't think teaching 10, 11 or 12 is difficult. People quite happily teach children, um, you know, uh, numbers, numerals like that. And the sh -th is just the same. Um, it's just, you know, the same things combined and they do something different and that, that's fine. Uh, we go over the short vowels because we need them for a lot of spelling rules, uh, like Y for E uh, and um, uh, Y saying E at the end of the word. So we go over some of the simple stuff that comes over quite a lot. Uh, and again, long and short vowels, and those split digraphs or the hop over digraphs or um, the magic E, as I say, it's the same, uh, same spelling patterns. It just has some different names, multiple names, uh, WH. Uh, and then we go over the alternatives that the children have already seen and are familiar with and should be able to read quite fluently words. In grammar one of the spelling side, this is quite obviously on the spelling side, this is what we are aiming for, is which words are spelt in this way, which words take these spellings, okay? Uh, and this is what we are concentrating on from now on, okay? They, they, need to know how to spell the words, which words take which spelling, which is in grammar one, why we do one type of uh, spelling grapheme uh, per week. Um, this actually does also echo and fits um, the pupil book two in the first year. There, there's a lot of overlap again, because the children need to come back and revise things. Um, they don't necessarily know things immediately or just because you've taught it once. You need to come back and keep revising uh, and building on their knowledge. Um, now, on the right, this is a page from the pupil book. It's got a bit of colour in it, but as they say, it's, it's the same information in both. Uh, the left is the teacher's um, side in the uh, teacher's book. Okay. That is a photocopyable sheet from the handbook. So as you can see, it is very similar. Uh, it's got the same information on it, just, just looks slightly different. Okay, so in the teacher's book, what you have is you have a small picture of the sheet that the children have, because it's always useful to know what they're doing. Okay, then it takes you through the lesson. You start off, obviously not the first week, because you haven't done that, uh, but with the spelling test, OK, um, so it will go over that. Then it tells you which um, it gives you some revision to do uh, with the digraphs uh, and uh, tricky words. So it takes you through um, telling you which what words to concentrate on and sounds to concentrate on and to revise with the children in that lesson. Then uh, it tells you about the 
sound or the, the spelling for that week gives you uh, some information uh, and um, things that you need to know uh, in order to teach uh, that particular spelling sound. It goes over the spelling list, which I will do in a minute because there is a, a reason why we have the list that we do. You can look at them either as dictation or as vocabulary as well. You know, spelling test, spelling list, spelling test sounds a bit. Mm. Um, but, you know, it, it could be just looked on as a vocabulary list if that is what is appropriate. It's really only dictation. They should know how to write these words. OK, so don't worry about it just because it sounds like it's um, something a bit formal. Uh, then it goes over the page and tells you what the children are supposed to do so you can explain it to them. And there are always some dictation. Now, dictation is very important. Again, it's another one of those words. If you say to people dictation, they go, mm -hmm. oh, that's a bit. OK, if I'm talking to the children, I wouldn't necessarily say dictation. If I'm talking to the children, I might say listen and write. It's just a nicer way of putting it. OK, and it's just extra practice at what we're doing, listening and then writing it down. OK, they don't need to be stressed about it. If they don't get it right, that's fine. We just say to them, oh, look, you know, that bit's wrong. Or look at that again, sound it out and listen. Are you sure that's right? OK, because we want them to be confident at putting things down. We don't want them to be stressing. We want to give them the skills. Um, and you've got some words there which you can use um, to call out for the children. Uh, and then underneath there are some sentences and the sentences build up with the tricky words. They're cumulative. So they build up with the sounds and the tricky words that you've been practicing as you go. So it's extra, um, extra practice for them. Doesn't have to be done in one lesson. You know, it depends, as I say, the length of your lessons and how often you have your children. It can be split, you know, you can talk about. See, in this one, as I say, it's a shh. So we would talk about the sound shh. We would talk about how you're forming. Then we would make a word bank on the board. I would make a word bank on the board, asking the children what words can, can they think of which have got a shh sound in them. So we would, um, as I say, write them all up. If I want to add any words in, then that's the point that I do. I will underline or point out the shh in all of them. Is it at the beginning? Is it at the end? Because the children are still sort of, you know, they're at the beginning of their learning journey. They need all this help. Then they get their sheet. Uh, the first one is filled in for them, fish. But the, uh, the rest, they then choose some words. They write the word uh, in a word in each fish and then draw a little picture to go with it to reinforce the comprehension and the understanding because we want to take that side with us as well. OK, we don't want them just to be able to go itch fish, but not have any idea what it means or even hear the word and write it down but not know, you know, what it what it means, because it is possible, um, you know, to do that. So again, um, comprehension um, all the time, uh, working uh, alongside. So we would do that for each, um, each lesson, uh, focusing on one uh, spelling at a time in grammar one. And they say it is for spelling. One of the reasons we uh, do quite a lot on the vowels is um, because English, again, is um, a bit complex um, because um, we have quite a lot of vowels. They can make a short sound or they can make a long sound. And actually, some of our spelling rules um, are bound up uh, with whether it's making a short or long sound, okay? And having taught the, the short ones, the a, e, i, or a, we have what we call our vowel containers. Um, so we get the children to listen, to use their ears. I tell my children they spell with their ears first, not their eyes, their ears first. Uh, and they 
I, I will show little cards. I can have little cards and I have, I've got a bag and a net and a bin and a box and a mug. Uh, and they have to say the word, okay? They don't see it because then they can see the letter. They, they have to say the word, listen for the sound, and then they put the card in the right um, box or bag in this case. Okay, fox, what sound, what short vowel sound can we hear in it? And it goes into the box, okay? Uh, and then when they're really good at that, I might add in some with something like cake, which obviously has got a long vowel in, uh, and they have to not put that in the box. They have to identify that it doesn't go into one of the containers uh, that we have. So again, we're training their ears to listen because if you've only got speech, if they're only, um, if they're saying the words and they're wanting to write it, your ears are what are giving you the clue because you've only got a blank piece of paper in front of you. So short words, um, which have got a short vowel, we call them flossy words. If they end in an F, an L, an S or a Z, okay, then they double the letter at the end. Okay, that's why they've got, why well, we have the double F, the double L, because it's a short vowel. Uh, this is one that gets, I can't tell you how many English teachers, when I say to them, how do you know when to use a CK or a K? They all just look at me and go, I just know. I know the word. Okay. Which is fine for them. But as I'm sure you're aware, when you're teaching small children, uh, the CK and K is like, it's confetti. It's like, <laughs> let's guess. I don't know. Let's put both in. We'll write bike, B-I-C-K-E. Okay. And actually, again, although I've said English is terrible for rules, this is a rule that does work consistently. If it's a short vowel, you need CK. I sometimes tell my children because to make it longer. If it's any other vowel sound, okay, so if it's any other vowel sound, not a, e, i, o, o, a, you only have a K. And actually, once you've taught children this, they're, they're fine with it. You know, they don't then make that mistake in those words again. And it doesn't matter whether they know the word, they've come across the word or seen it before. If they know the rule, they can cope with it and spell it correctly. <coughs> okay uh, and actually sometimes I like to take things off the paper you know just writing things down or studying is you know if you've got time it's great and I actually have a, a CK and a K which are cut out of uh, sugar paper and laminated uh, and I call words out and they have to hold out is it a K is it a CK um, and again it just gives them a way of um, checking and then you can talk about it if they've got it wrong or you know tell them they've got it right uh, it gives them a little bit of extra practice they can do that in small groups they can do it with a classroom assistant or a parent um, if they're having trouble um, so it's a good way of um, stopping something that's really quite common but really as I say if you teach the rule that goes with it it's not a problem at all Okay, again, your turn a little bit. So is it short vowel or a long vowel? Do I need, um, in this case, actually, it's a L, an L. Do I need one or do I need two, right? The first one is the shell. Have a think, do you need one or two? Is it a short vowel? Shell, sh eh. short vowel, so I need two. Okay, next one, hill. Again, short vowel, I need two. Uh, tail, tail, to A, A, not a short vowel. Okay, so I only need one. Seal, E, seal, I only need one. Okay, so again, you know, using these rules, being able to apply these rules makes it easier for the children when they come across words they don't know or they've never come across uh, before because we don't only want them to be able to deal with things that they, they know or they've, they've had before. Uh, again, to help them with the vowels, which are difficult, we have our short vowel hand, and we say to the children to remember the five vowel sounds, because we conveniently have five hands. A, E, I, O, A are the short vowel sounds, which come at the top. 
Uh, and I can, again, I could hold up the, the man card and they have to go, ah, and tell me it's a short, ah. I can hold up the fox and they have to point and tell me it's the oh sound, okay? And again, that way, even if you've got 30 children in front of you, you know they are all attending to you and learning, okay? If you're just talking and there's 30 children in front of you, at least half of them have drifted off somewhere uh, and they're not with you. But by doing something physical, you're keeping them with you. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, if, if you've said, what's what's the sound in bin? Okay, some of them are there immediately and you think, I don't need to worry about them, they're fine. Then you can see the ones who are going, because they're copying everybody else, you know they need a little bit of support and input and to help them. So it's quite a good way of, of tracking, um, you know, who's got it, who hasn't. Uh, then we add the uh, long vowel sounds in at the bottom. So A, E, I, O, and U. Okay. Uh, and then uh, as uh, my friend Tina in Australia says, you flip, which is a really good rule for reading. So you say to them, if one way doesn't work, try the other, flip it, flip. If A doesn't work, try A. If A doesn't work, try E. If it doesn't work, try I. If O doesn't work, try O. If A doesn't work, try U, or in fact, U. Um, and then that will get them out of words like acorn. Acorn, that's not a word. Acorn, that is a word. So they can get it for reading. As I say, for reading, that, that rule will get you out of, I can't tell you how many uh, problems and scrapes and, and get the word that you, you need. Really good rule. And again, that's just a physical way or giving them a visual because we're still multisensory, even though you know we're going up the age groups, a visual way to hang the information on. And I actually have uh, rubber gloves, uh, which we write the sounds on. Parents aren't always awfully keen on me writing on their children. Uh, so we have them on rubber gloves. Uh, at the moment, we've all got these, these blue, and blue plastic um, gloves because of COVID and everything else, haven't we? You can use those, write, write them on those, uh, anything like that. Uh, just help uh, the children uh, and they get um, they get used to, to flipping the two sounds. Uh, and as I say, with the OO, that's quite useful to introduce because things like flute, it's actually a U sound, but we can't say it. If you go flute, it, it gives you mouth gymnastics. So it's become an OO sound. Uh, and actually where I live in, in the UK, which is right on the East Coast on Bump, on the right hand side, uh, the locals up here, their accent, there is no U sound at all. They have computers. Uh, they read newspapers, okay? Everything is everything is oo. So again, that, that's uh, quite a, a good rule to know because that does happen quite a lot uh, within English. Uh, so having gone over the basic digraphs that they should know uh, from the original 42, then we spend some time concentrating on the split digraphs or the hopover digraphs because actually they are more difficult. They're not next to each other. They're not holding hands. Okay, they are one letter apart. So in this case, it's pin. We've got the I. Once we get that split digraph, okay, it's not pin anymore. It's pine because those two are working together. As I say, the influence is going backwards uh, over uh, to influence the, um, the I sound to make its long sound, I. Okay, but that's quite difficult because your eye has to track forward. Your brain then has to register that that's there and it's going to make a different sound and then they have to say it. So it needs a lot of practice. Uh, but again, it's exactly the same spelling rule for um, like in shell, like we say the doubling, right? In a word like rabbit, okay, that I is still there. It's a vowel. If we didn't double the B, it would be rabbit. Okay, so it doesn't just apply to an E. It's not just magic E, it's magic vowels, really. Um, but people tend to, now it, it's um, split digraphs or hop over digraphs is, is the, the phrase that tends to be used these days. Okay, the same with the word parrot. Okay, it's not an E there, it's an O, an O. 
but it would still make it a pay root if we hadn't doubled the R. Okay, and the CK, although it makes one sound, uh, that again, it still provides that wall um, that means that the influence can't go back. So if we want to say hopped, you know, we need, as I say, to remember that we need to double that P so the influence can't go back. And as we've seen, again, with um, putting the ED on uh, and using all those different spelling rules that we looked at earlier. So this is quite important for the children to understand. They need to know and understand that the, the short vowel and the spelling rules to apply it uh, for things like grammar. When we get to the split digraphs, the pages are a little bit different. Uh, we tend to put the, uh, we, we've given them the words and what they have to do is write in the split digraphs. Again, this is just trying to reinforce in their head that these two letters that aren't necessarily next to each other are still working uh, together. So they fill them in, read them, write the word down. Uh, if it's English as a, a foreign language, again, you need to work on the vocabulary, which you can do. Um, it, it's quite nice if you have some pictures. Uh, so um, you can go through, so you have a picture of a cake, you know, and you can talk about it with the children. You have a picture of a grape. And actually, if you have those on the wall or the board, when they're filling their sheet in, again, if English isn't their first language and you, you need to work on the vocabulary and comprehension, that is one way uh, of doing it and introducing it. When they have completed the sheet, um, I let them have a felt dip pen or a highlighter. For some reason, they get very excited if they're allowed to use a highlighter. Don't ask me why, uh, but it's great. And we have what I call our hop over spectacles. Uh, I do actually have a pair of very silly um, dress up spectacles that I put on, which have got arrows going around them. I don't mind looking a fool. Um, and, and we tell them you go round and then over the letter you're hopping over and then round, in this case, the e at the end. So they do that with the, um, the highlighter pen or the felt tip pen. Again, it reinforces, it gives them a visual that those are the two words that they're, uh, two letters that we're using and it's not g r a p a Rapper or good, rapper, a grapey. Okay, it, it, those two letters are working together. They are a unit. Uh, and actually, what we're doing within Grammar One is um, trying to um, show them the most common words that children might come across and use that take that spelling. Okay, uh, so we make up silly sentences. Okay, I tie my tie, I eat my pie, and I lie down in a field to die. Slightly morbid, I, I grant you, but tie, pie, lie, die, you've got most of the words that you need uh, with the IE in it. You do get things like, like magpie, which is bird, but it's still pie. Um, died, I mean, it's related to die. So things like that will help them. Um, we have another one where um, the snail with a painted tail waits for the train to Spain in the rain and hail. Okay, they're obviously all AI words and I get the children to uh, either color a picture or draw a picture. Uh, and then you can say to them, you know, when they're thinking about their spelling, is it in that sentence? Is, is the word you want um, snail tail? So it's an AI, okay. If the A sound comes at the end of the word, then they will know it's an AY. And if it's neither of those two things, try the split digraph. <laughs> so again, giving them ways to approach how, how they might want to spell a word um, and to do it, okay? And I like to ride my bike. Again, you know, they know that CK rule because we've taught them, they're all um, I hop over E words. Um, so again, they're all the same. They're all using that split digraph. Just helps them to, to remember it by giving them a bit of a context. Uh, and as I say, I do actually like to um, take things off the page a bit and not just do lots and lots of, of writing words. So we make little kites uh, which have tails. 
Uh, and the um, instead of having bows on the tails, we have little words uh, which they write. They can do the hopovers on. We can make a display. They can take it home, whatever it might, uh, whatever it might be. Um, but again, it's just a different way of doing it that, that's a bit more fun uh, and actually, you know, that will help the children to remember these uh, words better. As I said, the spelling list, there is a reason. They're not just a collection of words. The first two words are very short, completely regular. So all your children should be able to, to spell these. Uh, the third word will either have a initial blend, in this case, like clap, or a final blend, like in a word like next. Okay, now a blend is different to a digraph. Because in a digraph like shh, there's and the her come together and they make a completely different sound. It's not sir opera, okay, it's shh opera. But in the word clap, the k and the l are still both there, even though they sort of blend in together. And quite often, if you say to children, how do you what what sounds are in there, they go cl, cl, apa, because that cl blends, that colour blends into each other. So we get them thinking about, can I, the color, color, apa, it's all, um, th those, those letters, those sounds are still there. So it's a blend, it's not a digraph, they are different. Then we've got four words with the sound of the week in, okay? Uh, and again, those words have come from a list that mean that they are words that come up a lot uh, and words that come a lot within children's literature and things. Then we go over the spelling words, spelling words, the tricky words. Then we go over the tricky words. Okay, and we go over them two a week for spelling. They should know them for reading, but they need to know them for spelling. So we just go over two a week. Uh, and then the last word on the list is always a longer word because we did used to find that children were a bit frightened of longer words. You know, they could spell lots, they were quite happy with, with shorter words, but if it was a long word, they just go, oh, I can't do that. So right from the beginning, we try and give them experience of writing words of different lengths. Uh, the tenth word is normally what we call a compound word. So you can break it into two, so shampoo. So it's easier uh, for them to, to get hold of. And again, it starts introducing that idea of breaking long words down into smaller pieces in order to be able to read, spell, uh, and, and understand them. So there's a reason uh, for it all. As I say, just use them as dictation. Um, if you've got children that can't cope with 10, just give them four, okay? Cut the number down. Use the spelling list to help the children. Don't, don't bludgeon them with it. Um, don't necessarily as I say, even have to use it as a spelling test, use it as a vocabulary um, uh, um, exercise and just go over the words with them and sound them out and things like I, I'll do in a minute with you. OK, so again, use it in the best way for your children. Um, the compound word at the bottom, we have our compound word birds. There are... Um, templates in the back of the book you'll see in a minute um, so you can make these up and have sets of them you know once you've made them you've got them there they're in a box in the classroom uh, sometimes it's the the root word that has um, lots of different words that you can add on to it like you know clockwork um, so right, when you get to do these you actually think about it then you um, clockwise clockwork okay seaside seaweed seagull uh, sometimes it's the other way around um, and it's a tale, so blackbird, bluebird, but they can play about with the words. Obviously, again, if it's English as a foreign language or an additional language, uh, you can make up, let's say that's the template from the, the back of the handbook. I make up the words and they have to put them together. Sometimes, like on this one, ladybird, okay, I will often, um, I, I might have cards so they can match them up because blackbird is fine it's a bird that's black ladybird well i suppose it's got wings but that's about as far as we can <laughs> i can stretch um so it's completely different um completely different word 
when two quite normal words are put together. So again, we, we would have boxes of these which will help our vocabulary and will help us with our compound words and will help us with our spelling. Why do one thing when you could do several all at the same time? Okay, uh, now I would always have my spelling words up somewhere, the spelling words for that week up somewhere in the classroom. Okay, and every day, every day, sometimes twice a day, if I'm, you know, a bit late for going out for lunch, um, or a bit early, and I need to do something just for a minute or a couple of minutes, and I will go over them. Okay, I will have them up somewhere and with the children, we I will, will go ah, mm, am. Okay, how do I write am? Ah, mm, and we will hold up our fingers and we will count. Um, I can do it on the board and go g, a, e, t, get. Okay, and I, I run my hand along for the whole word. I know people who do it on their arm. Um, so g, e, t, get. Doesn't matter how you do it, any of those ways, um, but we go over them. Shop. Okay, and I might go sh. Or per or sh or per. and again, understanding that that sh at the beginning is um, is the digraph. So I will go through them, and because you are going through them with them every day, that means they're learning them, they're understanding them. Some children have lots of help at home, but some children don't, and this is a way of making sure that the children who don't necessarily have help help at home still get the learning that they need from uh, what we're doing. And again, I can do similar things with, if I take the word flame, okay? And I can show that hop over. Um, I know someone who calls it a dive. So f, l, a, a dive over the top, m, okay? So you're showing the children by using little symbols, how the word is working, okay? And that f, l, flame, you've got a blend, fl, 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 f, l, it's reinforcing that it's two, uh, two sounds, okay? Um, so let's have a little go um, and we'll go through. So, k, l, a, Per clap. Okay, we've got the word. W, e, sh, wish. And again, physical activity, it, it helps cement things in the brain. Sh, a, m, p, u. Again, I try and move my hand to show them uh, what we're doing uh, with the, the spelling and the blending. G, R, A, P, okay, and I will make them do it with me. L, I, T, O, okay, because you've got the double, so it's a bit like a digraph in a way, uh, and the U at the end, okay. N, O, so we've got two digraphs in, in that one. Okay, so I will go over the words. Uh, I might do it on the board, I might do it with my hands, however, but, but reinforcing the learning about the spelling and how the words go. And that is really powerful. It only takes a few minutes and that really, really helps the children. You can also do it with the tricky words. The tricky words are tricky because they contain something that hasn't yet been taught or is so irregular that it only exists in one particular word, okay? But the tricky words are words that come up regularly and commonly, and we need them to write sentences, okay? But actually, it is still easier to approach them in a similar sort of way. Don't worry about the bits that are regular. Only worry about the bits that are irregular, because that's the bit you need to remember, okay? So we're cutting down what the children need to remember, because they're applying the rules that are perfectly good. And a word like said, right, the s is perfectly regular. We don't need to learn that. The d at the end is perfectly regular. We don't need to learn that. That's the bit we need to learn. That bit in the middle, because that is the tricky bit. 
Uh, normally that would say a, but we don't say said. It's making an S sound in this case. So we have said, but that's the bit we need to remember. Okay. And that's how I would teach all uh, the tricky words. Um, the I, the whole thing obviously is tricky, but I tell the children that I is shy. You know, we said he didn't like coming on the end of words. It's all shy. Okay, equally, it doesn't like being on its own, but it is on its own and it can't bring its cousin Tuffy Y in. So it puffs itself up to be the capital letter uh, when he comes by himself. Okay, the or the. There are a lot of different um, pronunciations of this in the, uh, the UK. We do say the sometimes as well. The, the. If it's a sound, it's only the TH. If it's a tricky word, it needs that air on the end. Okay, that's quite a simple way of explaining it. Uh, and also means that hopefully in words like um, bath, you don't end up with the E on the end, which is uh, what tends to happen as soon as you start introducing things like this. Okay, so the sound doesn't have the air on the end, <coughs> but the tricky word does. Okay, he, she, me, we, be, again, it's that air on the end, okay? It's not making um, the short sound air like it should do, but do you remember that flip? Air doesn't work, say e, her e, sh, e, e, oh, we've got the words. So they just have to remember that if they're writing it, although they're going to sound out her e, they're only gonna write it with one air, not two. Okay, was, again, it's that a in the middle, that they need to remember. Was says was. What does funny things to the letter at in English? That's why we have things like was and swan. They come to that later on. Okay. Um, so they only need to remember that was says was. Uh, to do, again, it's a pattern. It's similar. It should be ooh, but it's only one. It's only one letter, not two. R is the same as the um, the. If it's a sound, it's just the AR. If it's a tricky word, it needs that E on the end. Uh, and all, it has that or sound at the beginning, uh, which is in the same like in talk and walk, but we haven't quite taught it yet at the moment. And it's a word that comes up quite often. So as I say, I will talk them through the tricky words. I will point out what is tricky uh, and then we will um do what we need to do in order uh, to get them to learn it and understand it we teach uh the alphabet because obviously um we do need the alphabet we teach the alphabet um and we teach it in the four colors we call them alphabet quarters, but obviously they're not quarters of the alphabet because there's more letters in some than the other. Uh, but the, um, the, the principle is that um, I haven't done this. I take somebody else's word for it because my life is too short. If you take the English Oxford Dictionary and you divide the English Oxford Dictionary into quarters, the first quarter will have words beginning with the letters A to E. The next quarter will have words beginning with the letters F to M and so on. So we've got um, the four um, groups with the different colors uh, and the children learn uh, the alphabet because they need the alphabet. We don't start with the alphabet in reading because actually on the whole, what we do with the alphabet is we go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Okay, we don't go abaca. We could, but we don't. We go A, B, C, D, E. The alphabet is useful for ordering words and things. Okay, it's not useful for reading because we need the sound, but it is um, for ordering your registers, um, you know, things that you need, need to be able to find quickly and to look up if it's an alphabetical order, uh, you know where to go, which of course means a dictionary. That's what we do with a dictionary. And we teach how to use the dictionary. I find it quite amazing that people give children a dictionary, which is quite a thick book with a lot of information in and tell them to look a word up and they haven't actually taught them how to do it. 
So we teach how to do it. And obviously you start by learning the alphabet. Our dictionary has color coded pages, as you can see, uh, and this one is an L. So it's in the yellow section and the pages. And you can see that when you look at the side of the book, you can see the different colors. Uh, and we teach them if they're looking for a word beginning with an, an L, with the L, then they open it at the yellow section. OK, if they're looking for a word that begins with P, they open it at the green section. So rather than saying I want to look up the word moat and opening a dictionary and starting at page one, two, three, half an hour later, you might have got up to J. OK, they know whereabouts to start looking to open the dictionary and then they just need to make a little adjustment. So we actually teach them about using the dictionary and that from the dictionary, uh, they can find a number of things out. They can find spelling, okay, obvious. They can find the meaning of the word. They can actually find the pronunciation. If you notice next to the word moat, it says moat again, but it's got those slash signs. Okay, that normally means the sound, or in this case, the pronunciation, uh, and we have used the, um, the joined O, which is the original O sound that we taught them uh, to represent it. As I say, it's the same in this case, but um, in others it won't be. So they can get the pronunciation from the dictionary. Again, we're always trying to make them independent readers, not to have to go and ask somebody or hear it somewhere else. If they need to do it, then they, they can. Okay, And you've also got which part of speech it is. So in this case, the moat, which is the, the water that goes around a castle um, or a house, um, is a noun, which is at the, um, at the end here. OK, so lots of information that they can get from uh, the dictionary. And as I say, what we want to do is make them independent uh, learners. Uh, grammar two, we move them on because they should have a really good grasp of the basic 42 and the main alternatives that we have taught them so far. So we talk about either silent letters or silent digraphs. So things like in lamb, uh, the B on the end, you don't actually pronounce. Um, we talk about soft C and soft G. Um, so if a C or G is followed by an E, I or Y, it makes a soft S or a J sound. So we give them the examples. OK, this is all written in the teacher's notes in the book. As I say that um, the W does funny things to an A instead of saying wa, it says wa. OK, and we build up again their knowledge a bit more. We'll see uh, a bit more of it in a bit. Um, which long vowel spelling do we have? Do we have um, the AI, the AY, or the A hop over E? Okay, so we talk, um, we talk about that and we show them how to start choosing and then saying when you've made your choice or you think that you know you're right, look it up in a dictionary because that's how you check. Even as an adult, you know, that's what you do if you want to um, understand and make sure that your, your spelling is correct. Um, again, we look at more alternatives for things that they know. And then we start introducing spelling patterns. So shun is not one sound, really sh or no, sh uh, no, it's actually a swa really. Okay, but it comes up a lot in words. So we start teaching patterns and moving away from, from actual sounds because actually they know quite a lot by this time. So all the time we're moving their understanding uh, and their abilities um, on. Uh, so this is from um, a grammar two book. So again, we still have um, a word bank that you can make with children uh, and they write the words that they want to uh, in, the, in the word bank. Less room. Again, make sure they understand the words that you are choosing and talking about and that they are writing down. Or you could do perhaps a little phrase in that space and they write a picture. Again, it's what's relevant to your children. Uh, we have the spelling list again. Uh, this time, instead of just written out, they have to put 
um, the, the, the grapheme or the spelling or the spelling pattern, they have to write it into the, um, into the list there. We have some comprehension or a close. So she got the answer and they have to look and choose one of the spelling words to fit in there. Um, we have not tricky words because they should know them by this time in grammar too, but we have word families, various sorts of families. It's actually his family, but we have numbers and other things. Uh, and then there is some revision, which might be spelling or it might be to do with the grammar. OK, but we have that at the bottom of the sheet, again, just to give a bit of extra practice, help and support for the children. And as I say, one of the things they need to do is they need to be able to say, I know these three different ways to make this sound or two different ways to make this sound. Which word, which way do I need to write this word? So like a word like wait, OK, it could be with a hop over diagram. It could be the AI that we know, or it could be the AY. And we look at it and we think, well, no, it's not the AY because that comes on the end. So that bottom one is definitely out. Wait, right, the, the snail with the painted tail waits, wait. AI, yeah, that's that one. I'm going to choose that one. And they, they circle that. And again, if they've chosen one, but they're not entirely certain, okay, they can use a dictionary to look it up, we encourage them to use a dictionary to look it up. So again, we're refining not just their knowledge of spelling, but their ability to apply what they know in order uh, to spell words correctly. Again, um, we have our vowel forest. Don't get lost in the vowel forest because that's what makes life difficult. Uh, and they look at the different words. And again, you can either have pictures or you can have words. Uh, and, and they sort things out. And again, it's a way of making it um, physical and not just writing things down, checking to see if they're right, looking at it. Then you can move things around. Um, different way of doing the same thing. This is just with words. Uh, and again, they put them on the right um, tree. Again, you can do it with short and long vowels. You have a tree for the short vowels, a tree for the long vowels, and they have to sort uh, the cards out. Spelling is slightly different. Um, but again, a reason for them, uh, one to seven are regular words. Um, no, one and two are regular words, but they might have a digraph that they're supposed to know a consonant blend in. The next ones have got the spelling of the week or the spelling pattern of the week in, and the last one are the word families, okay? And these are the word families. So we start off, they are family words. The next ones are the months, again, because they're really useful. Children need to know these. We really need to make sure that they get them right. We have numbers, maths, and then just some useful words that um, are often badly spelt or often misspelt. So again, they're building up the children's um, knowledge. And then at the end of each um, term, actually at the back of the handbook, there is a list and you can send them home for half term or holiday homework or to go over or something just to reinforce and make sure that the children know them. Okay, we talk about um, prefixes and suffixes. So they say in this overlap between grammar and spelling. Okay, a prefix, pre is easy. Okay, it comes before, so it's added to the beginning of a word. A suffix is added to the end of the word. Okay, it might change the meaning. Um, you know, it does all sorts of things to a word, but we we look at it, we have our suffix, suffix. again, we have the template in the back of the book, you can make up uh, sets that you can use with the children and they can have a look at them. But again, we have the spelling rules, which we've already looked at, which apply to uh, suffixes. Suffixes for things like comparative adjectives, where you add the er uh and the s, new, new and newest, it's exactly the same rule. So when you teach them about comparative adjectives and adding that suffix, okay, they already know if it's a short vowel, we double the consonant. If it's a Y, then the I comes back. Again, you're building up their knowledge all the time. You're applying what they've taught them to the new bit of knowledge that's coming on. And then you're not teaching, you know, you're not teaching comparative adjectives, you're not teaching ER and EST, you're not teaching how to put them on because your knowledge, the knowledge that you're giving the children is all 
providing them with this holistic um, understanding and approach. And grammar, the grammar side stays exactly the same. We build it up a little bit at a time and we start off very simply. OK, we go over capital letters uh, and, and what a sentence is. Uh, we spend a long time teaching the formation of lowercase. Don't spend so much time on the formation of uppercase. OK, but uh, we do need to do this. Um, so we um, go over that. The letter names. OK, because it's A, B, C, D, E, as I said, with the alphabet. But they also need to know the sounds. So if they if the word comes at the beginning of uh, a sentence, just because it's a capital letter, it doesn't say its name. It still says its sound within the word. So, again, we explain that with the children. As I say, we always start very simply and then we always build up. So we start talking to them and say that sentences start with a capital letter. They end with a full stop and they must make sense. And I always make my children speak a sentence. OK, like if we're doing our news. I went to the park. OK, because otherwise what we get is I went to the park and I went on the slides and I went on the swings and I went here and I went there. And it's not a sentence. It's just a whole string joined by ands that goes on forever and ever. But if I can get them and we do this to show our full stop, if I can get them doing that physically, speaking a sentence, I am far more likely to get it in their writing. And if they know they've got the full stop, the next word starts with a capital letter. So you're getting that in as well, okay? We have our scrambled sentences. So again, by physically moving little pieces of paper around, um, it, it, it's easier in, in some ways than writing. If they get it wrong, you can discuss it with them and understand why, get them to reread it. So the beginning of proofreading, okay? Uh, and then they either stick it in or they can write it in their book. As I say, they know it's right. We can even talk about what happens if these two words move around. Can I see a B? Now, okay, we've got a question. Okay, so there's lots of, of, of chat and talk and things that you can do with the children um, without them having to write it down uh, and, and, you know, making sure it's right before they do so. The other place they see capital letters is proper nouns, the name of people, places and things, important people, places or things. OK, so we talk about um, addresses, uh, days of the week. As I say, we're multisensory, so it has a colour which is black, which you can't really see for the nouns here. But a proper noun has an action and we touch our finger to our forehead to indicate that it's a proper noun. OK. That just helps children think about it. And if it's a proper noun, it will need a capital letter. We talk about things like addresses. I'm always trying to broaden out my, um, my learning. OK, they might be learning about proper nouns, but we can learn about how you write your address. Even in this day and age with emails, OK, you know, all the forms you fill in, you've got to put your address in it. Uh, addresses are written in different ways in different countries. Uh, again, which is not something children always uh, appreciate. And again, we can use it to look at different places around the world. There are lots and lots of books out there. Again, you know, it's not just a linear process. Don't just up, up the grammar, next lesson, next lesson, next lesson. Take it sideways, get that understanding, get that, um, you know, the vocabulary, talking all the time, asking questions, finding out about different things and applying what you're um, teaching them because that's why we're teaching it. Not because they need to know what a proper noun is, because they need to know how that works within the language, okay? Uh, common nouns, still black, but we just put our hand on our head. And again, lovely, um, great opportunity for vocabulary learning. Um, we say, it's a very crude definition, but if you can take a picture of it, it is probably a noun. If you can put an at or a the, the indefinite or the definite article in front of it, it is probably a noun, okay? Uh, and you can go on a little trip with your camera, uh, look at pictures um, and, and find the noun words within them or go for a little walk. Um, the, the, photo is not too great so I'll put some so in the classroom we have little um just 
black pieces of paper with a hole in the middle, they pretend they're cameras and they look around and they find, uh, they find all the common nouns. They're not important enough for a capital letter because it's any old table, any old chair, you know, it, it, it's not something, but we go and we do lots of vocabulary building. Uh, and then we can put in some sentence structure. I can see a slide, I, there is a seesaw. There is the see where is the seesaw in the garden is it okay get them talking get them speaking and confident in speaking so if you say can you see a table they have to say i can see a table not just point to it okay get them used to speaking and confident in um in speaking as well even just a small teeny tiny picture like that okay you've got the comprehension is a cat sleeping yes or no but is this a cat? Is this a dog? You know, so much you can get from it. Is it a black cat? Uh, in fact, it's a ginger cat. I know it looks orange, but um, in the UK, every cat that has colour is actually ginger. Okay, it's just a convention. Uh, but as I say, everything, just take the opportunity to, to get all that, um, you know, that talking. You know, they hear you talking they hear the cadences of the language as well. So it's really, really, um, really, really good and really, really useful. Okay, for the yes, no, the comprehension I have, they're just plastic cups, okay? And I have the, um, the, the little sentences on cards uh, and they have to put them into the right pot. So again, I can give sets of these out, they can do them, I can go back afterwards, check if they understand. Nouns can come singly or in plurals. Uh, the simplest way of making a plural in English is by adding an S. So we're back to our spelling link. Okay, it's a grammar thing that is indicated by a spelling thing. Uh, if words end with a ch, a sh, a s, or a x, which actually is two sounds, which is the S, then they have an ES. And again, in the back of the handbook, we have um, our, what I call our pull-out plurals. So again, they can play about and do something. And again, they say one ladybird, three, uh, three ladybirds, and they emphasize that sound. Uh, when I'm doing this, I do tend to give them cards with um, nouns which, have, which take the regular, which take the S on, because it's so easy uh, that they pick out words that don't. But again, that's a, another vocabulary building uh, opportunity that you can use the words that you are working on uh, for vocabulary. So you could use food, um, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, again, we come back. It's the same rules that keep coming up. If you want to make a plural with a word ending Y, you'll never guess what happens. Okay, Y is no longer at the end. Or the eyes, so the eye comes back. So again, you know, we've, we've applied that rule, we've taught it to them. They just sail through this because they've already got the information that they need. And again, you know, I can't say how important applying and using what you're teaching is to so the children can see why you're doing it as a holistic process, not, not just because they're learning what a noun is here and they're learning a set of spellings here and then they're doing a different set of vocabulary over there, okay? So I do lots of things. Uh, very Hungry Caterpillar, very famous book, everybody knows it, but we can change it. So on Monday, snake, not the caterpillar, eats an orange. So that's one orange, and it's uh, beginning with a vowel sound. It needs an an in the beginning. So again, lots of learning. On Tuesday, he eats two pies. So we're getting into plurals, okay? You can change what he eats. He could go somewhere different. He could see different things. It doesn't matter, okay? But what you're doing is showing the children what they're learning and showing it within uh, the language. And again, you know, use the words that you're using, use the words from the spelling list and things. And then, you know, on Sunday, it doesn't eat anything because it's very thick. Okay, so lots of learning and things like that and applying what you've been teaching. Adjectives describe nouns. Their color is blue. Okay, we say, we put it on the side of the head, it's our um, action for it. Uh, and it's lots of things, it's colors, it's texture, all those sorts of things. Again, lots of vocabulary learning there. And this is a picture from the big book. And there is so many pictures and things and whatever in it. 
We use snakes. You don't have to, as I say, broaden out the learning. You could do fish, all the different colored fish. Good old Elm and the elephant. They can all design an elephant with different uh, um, adjectives, an old, a colorful, a flowery, a shiny, whatever it might be. Talk about a castle. It's creepy. It's gray. It's beautiful. It's big. OK, broaden out what you're doing. You've taught them about adjectives. That's great. But don't just then move on to the next thing. OK, they can use adjectives to describe themselves. I love that one on the left. Smart, kind, tall, intelligent, brave. It's just tucked under there, but he does admit to being naughty. OK, to describe themselves. Or on the right, we've got the gingerbread man. So you could do a story uh, and they have to describe the, uh, the gingerbread man in this case. And then when you get them to write the story, they are more likely then to use um, adjectives and other things to describe what's going on and what they're doing. So all the time, as I say, yeah, apply it to, to the rest of the work and what they're doing. You can do something very simple. Just give them some words, suggest some adjectives, which adjectives they crept through the what forest, the dark forest, the green forest, the scary forest, the creepy forest. OK, lots of things. Or give them the sentence and they have to underline it in blue. OK, you can turn it round on its head. But again, lots of learning, lots of information in it. Uh, I quite like monsters for this uh, because, again, they're imaginary and you can get all sorts of, of different adjectives going, um, going on. Uh, and you can talk about your monster. Why is it scary? Where does it live? What does it do? All that sort of thing. And again, you're getting into story writing. OK, you know, we don't just want to know these things. We don't just want to be able to talk. We want to we want to start, um, you know, being able to compose and story write. Uh, and that's actually she from Grammar 2, not monsters, but aliens. But we describe, you know, the aliens. It's green, it's hairy, it's slimy, it's whatever, um, whatever they decide. But again, it's playing about and enjoying the language and the learning as well. OK, we teach about verbs which are red and they're doing words. So we pretend to run. In the hive, we have what we call the infinitive. So to read, to sit, if it's got that two in front of it, it's that root, uh, the root word, the infinitive, to sleep, to eat. And then there are bees, which we always think of as being very busy and doing things, uh, doing lots of things in the picture. And again, lots of things to talk about within it. And again, I will play games. I will say, we have a game here called Simon Says. So you only do it if Simon says, but we have Inky says. So Inky says hop. So as Inky said it, they have to hop. Okay. Inky says stand. So they have to stand. And then if you say sing, okay, Inky didn't say it, so they don't sing. But again, they're listening, they're understanding. You are practicing the verbs that you uh, are working on. So again, it's, it's nice to, as I say, take the learning sideways. Uh, we wrote a little poem um, about the ladybird. Um, she runs, the verbs are in red, she runs along the twig, she stops at the end, she jumps into the air, she flaps her wings and flies across the garden. OK, again, you can give them the verbs that you want them to use and get them to make up a little poem, a little sentence, a little story. OK, and then they can draw a picture. Um, and they're using what they know. They're writing sentences. Verbs happen in time, either the past the present or the future okay and again we've talked about this regular way of making ed the other thing about it is when you're listening and using your ears this suffix can either make an ed sound it can make a d sound or it can make a t sound okay when they're listening they don't know that so if they hear a t sound they will write a but if they know their grammar and they know it's a past tense, and they hear that t sound at the end, they know to write ed. So they get the correct spelling. Okay. So we say all the time uh, there is this crossover. So we give them um, experience of, of doing that and thinking about that. Um, not all verbs in English are regular. Okay. We have um, irregular or tricky pasts, we call them, like the tricky words. They're not, not doing what you expect them to. Uh, so we learn some of those. So win, won, uh, ran, run, all that sort of thing. Um, 
where you change the verb again that's harking back to old english because that's how they used to change the um they change the tense by changing the vowel letter so um we, we've got quite a few of those that are uh, about the place so we, we teach those uh and then we look at the future now the future needs an auxiliary or a helper verb which is to be so we look at the verb to be uh, and then how um, it, it is used to form the future so i look is the present i looked it's got that ed you can hear that t sound but i know i'm not going to write t on the end i'm going to write ed because i know it's a past tense uh, and we've got the future i shall look uh, i shall and i will are now interchangeable Purely, technically, shall is the correct one for I or we for the first person. But actually, it's, um, as I say, it, it will is used instead these days. So again, we can say they can identify the verb and it's in past, present or future. OK, the race will start. So they know it's in the future. She brushed. ED. And again, I have little cups um, and sentences and they put them in the right cups or the children stand at the front and they have past, present or future on hats. Uh, and again, it's getting them to look at the words and identify which tense they're in, which they have to do actually by looking at the spelling. By the time they finish, oh, yeah. by the time they finish, they will have learned nine different tenses. Uh, we put them in our tense tent. I have to be careful when I say that. Um, again, it gives the children a visual to think about the tenses and, and how they go and where they go. OK, we don't do all of these in grammar one and two. But say this is by the time they finish. But we build up and we build up using the tense and, and the, it, it helps the children let's say to be able to visualize how it all works. Why do we use the actions? Again, a bit like when I was saying we were using the hands and children, you've got 30 children in front of you to make sure they're all with you. So we'll say, right, um, I'm going to call a word out. I want you to do the action, uh, run. So they'll do this, okay? Uh, London, so they do this, because it's a proper noun. And then I can say to them, if it's a proper noun, what do I need to remember? I need to remember a capital letter. OK, so again, all the time you're reinforcing what you're teaching. Uh, then I might say something like brush and then I'll get some of them doing this. I'll get some of them doing this and then I'll get the clever clogs who are doing this because actually you need to know from the sentence. Is it a noun? Is it a brush, a hairbrush that I'm holding? Or am I brushing my hair? And it's a verb. Now, that's quite a complex grammar uh, idea that words can, can be different parts of speech and you need to know the meaning. But actually it's very, very simple. It, it's introduced and the kids have no problem with it whatsoever. We look at pronouns, which are small words which take the place of name. So instead of Peter did this, Peter did that, Peter went here, Pete, okay, you put in you or he or she or it. Once they, again, they have actions. I, you, you point to one person. He, you point to a chap. She, it, I point to the floor. We, you make sure it takes in yourself so they understand that that's the first person. You, so point to lots of other people. And they, we normally point to the class next door. So again, you know, and immediately they say to me, but you've got two you's. And you go, yes, but one singular, one's plural. Again, it's adding those levels of understanding in. You can then conjugate verbs. I look, you look, he, she, it looks. Oh, that's different, isn't it? That's got an S on the end. OK, so if it's he, she, it, it needs that S on the end. So, again, it's so obvious when you look at it like this. If you just tell someone that, then it, it doesn't. Um, it, it doesn't sink in so well. Then adverbs describe verbs. So verb adverbs describe them. Their colour is orange. They mostly end with an L-Y, but not always. Don't be uh, fooled, OK? Uh, so they ate um, hungrily. They sang tunefully, whatever it may be. Again, lots of opportunity for um, vocabulary uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, and we play the adverb game. 
Uh, again, I quite often either have cards or I give the words out. Uh, it depends on the ability of the children. So you have um, a verb like shout, and then they have to do it how the adverb says. Um, so the person at the front is the only one that knows what the adverb is. So the, the children watching will say shout, and they have to go shout, shout, I'm shouting, okay? Uh, or then they might um, say another verb like swim. So I have to go splish, splash, splish, splash and indicate that they, they're swimming sort of loudly. <laughs> OK, and they have to guess what the adverb is, but it's just a silly game. But again, as I say, it just helps uh, the children to uh, to practice things in a way that's not just writing it down on a sheet of paper and to understand the meaning. We have oh, oh, lots more adverbs there. Right what we call our expand a sentence. Um, you can get a spelling age, you can get a reading age. There are lots of, uh, you know, stuff out there that you can say, oh, my children are working a year above their chronological age. Oh, my children are working two years above their chronological age. Grammar is not the same, okay? There is no test out there that says my children are working at whatever stage at grammar. The only way that you can um, sort of work out um, how you're doing is if they are using what you are teaching them within their writing, okay? Um, so we do expand a sentence. So we start off with a very simple sentence. We say, add an adjective. So it might be, I don't know, the fierce dog. The fierce dog barked. Then we might say to them, add another one. The small fierce dog barked, okay? Uh, Let's add an adverb, how did he bark? The small fierce dog barked excitedly. Okay, so again, you are, you're building up their knowledge and it, showing them it's these details that are making the sentence more interesting. So we've started with that little three word sentence uh, and we've got to the small fluffy dog barked excitedly. Okay, much more descriptive. And then we can start using our question words and saying to them, you know, where was he? When was it? Why was he barking? All those sorts of things. And we can get a much bigger sentence. Okay, the dog barked. That's fine, nothing wrong with it. Boring. The small fluffy dog barked excitedly at the two children as they ran into the garden. Okay, use it as a story starter. Make a collection of them. The child whose uh, sentence you pick for the story starter thinks it's great, you know, that's really important. And you can, you can use them, you can have a bank of them in the classroom, or they have to use that sentence in a piece of writing. Again, it's using it and expanding it um, and showing them, you know, more complex sentence structure, which we need to move them on to. We have a lot of homophones in English. Uh, homo meaning the same, phone is a sound. Again, you need to know the right spelling or you're going to put the wrong word. Uh, so, you know, is it right as in I'm writing? Is it right as in turn right? So we, we go over a lot of these. And in fact, a lot of these are connected to the grammar as well. You know, are and our, two, two and two, there and there. It's connected to the grammar. If you know it, you can pick it. Okay. They are, spelled T-H-E-R-E, -E, is a position word, a preposition, like here, there, where. Okay, so if that's what it is, you need the E-R-E -E spelling. Their, E-I-R, is a possessive adjective, so it describes who it belongs to. Okay, so you need the E-I-R spelling. They are, with the Y apostrophe R-E, is short for they are. Okay, it's part of the verb to be. So if you can... Um, substitute they are into the sentence that's the there you will need but again they're applying the knowledge to the spelling to choose the right one our and are that's terrible over here because they all say are it just just a universal um word so we often get um like our house and they'll spell it a-r-e our -E, house okay but by emphasizing the our and that it's a um a possessive um adjective then we're more likely to get the right spelling, but I won't say uh, we do very often. Uh, that's something we have to spend quite a lot of time working on. Okay, and we look at things called synonyms. Uh, I love this uh, quote. It's a word you use when you can't spell the other one so, so often to me. 
<laughs> I think of a lovely word, but if I can't spell it correctly or, or we use a different one, we call them better words. OK, so. Writing, as I say, can be quite boring. If you've got a story and da 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 said this, da 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 said that, da 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 said the other. OK, if we can encourage them to think of lots of other words that could mean the same, uh, then, you know, it makes their writing better and more interesting. So we have our word webs, which they have to fill in. OK, uh, and, um, you know, lots of words you could use instead of said, called, replied, roared, hissed, muttered, whispered, whatever it uh, might be. And of course, then you explain to them and you show them what a difference a word makes. So I'm going out, said Inky. I'm going out, whispered Inky. I'm going out, hissed Winky. Inky. I'm going out, shouted Inky. I'm going out, replied Inky. OK, so we do lots of things like that. Again, it shows what the difference is, but it shows how you can make your writing and your work and your speech more interesting. Uh, not just said there are lots of other ones within the um, with, within the program uh, that the children get to use and to think about to use dictionaries and thesauruses. We're moving on into that direction um, now. We teach prepositions which are to do with position. They, they normally show where one noun is in compared to another noun, which is why we have the action. The color is green. And um, we introduce it uh, by talking about Inky going along a road under some trees. So he has a little journey where he uses lots of uh, prepositions. <coughs> uh, and again, I will have little um, cards. Oh. Rose's Walk is a great book for prepositions, okay? There's not a lot of um, words in it by itself, but you can get so much out of that book as you go along with the fox and the hen and where they go and what they do. I also, this is a picture from one of our readers. And again, I can condense uh, what we're using, the words that we're using down um, by choosing like the prepositions I want the children to use. So I want them to use these prepositions because uh, those are the ones that we're looking at or that we've been studying. Uh, and I can say the monster road along the road by the shops, near the school, across the bridge, and the willow tree to get to the pond. I can make them expand it into a story. The monster road along the road that led from his house. Okay, he went by, um, the shops where Mrs. Singh sells her spices, whatever, you know, okay. Past the school, the children were out of play. What did he see? So again, you can use it, you can do it, then you can um, expand it uh, into other things. The last part of speech we go over is conjunctions, which are purple and they're the joining words. So again, moving from simple to more complex sentences. Um, and, and we just give them some to start with, and then we build up their knowledge uh, as we go. The reason we use the colors is because then we can do something called parsing, where you look at the words in a sentence and you decide what job they're doing. So like the brush, is it a brush as an object? Is it brush as a verb? And then the children can either underline, or if you're doing it on a computer and remote learning, you can, um, you know, change the color of your font uh, and they can underline and get to understand what the different uh, words in the sentence are doing. So if I do that, it will change into uh, the right color. Again, it's extending the children's understanding and learning and knowledge and looking and, and beginning to analyze sentences. You know, if you go up um, to, to do English uh, literature and things, you need to analyze sentences. And this is the start of it. We also look at punctuation, I say the last, the last part, uh, because punctuation is very important and can change the meaning. A woman without her man is nothing? Oh, I don't think so. A woman without her man is nothing, okay? Completely changes the meaning by the use of punctuation, very important. We do speech marks, we start off very, very simply because most children are you know, very used to comics, which have got speech bubbles. 
we talk about animal noises. Again, I was amazed to find that animals make different noises in different countries. Not only do we speak differently, apparently animals do as well. Uh, we had a very uh, amusing uh, few minutes when I was uh, doing something in Mexico at the weekend, uh, working out the, the different noises that dogs make. And I'm quite certain that our dogs in the UK do not say what the Mexican dogs say. Uh, and then, um, you know, we explained that what comes out of your mouth is a bit that you're in speech marks and actually you can draw the bubbles uh, and on the board and write the words in and then erase the rest of the speech bubble so that you only leave like the little marks. We teach about commas in lists so to separate the words in lists so um, the, the stall sold apples comma pears comma and bananas. Uh, if you don't know about Kung Fu punctuation, look it up, it's quite good. But again, it's putting that physical into it. So the stool sold as the commas and actually make them do a comma. Or if they do a full stop, uh, they can do an exclamation mark. Uh, and again, by um, physically putting that physical into there, um, it works really well that then comes out in the writing. Apostrophe S to show belonging that we've talked about. So B's umbrella, Sam's dog, Ben's drum. Um, you know, when do you use these things? Unless you teach children, how are they supposed to know? I wouldn't know. So, I'm hoping that by the time you finished and the children who have been taught in this way will spell and punctuate more accurately, they will have a wider vocabulary, they will produce better and more interesting pieces of writing because we, we, we've taught them in this, this way that, that means they see everything as a whole. Uh, and they have a clear understanding of, of how the English language works and that you and the children write and say exactly what you mean, because otherwise there's no point, is there? And I've just got one more slide you'll be pleased to know, uh, which is uh, a small piece of writing um, by a year two child, so grammar two, um, showing uh, their use of punctuation. It's not actually from my class because in year two in my school, we would have joined up writing. This is actually from Australia um, and they don't, they're, they're not big on joined up writing, which is a bit odd really. Um, they don't do it till later on, but it's showing what you can achieve um, by teaching all these things and, you know, getting, getting the punctuation, uh, uh, you know, we've got question marks, all this sort of thing. And this is what we're doing it for. This is what we're aiming for. So I'm going to stop now. <laughs> stop talking for the moment anyway. Uh, and uh, questions, are there questions? There's probably loads of questions, but I say. Hey, thanks, Sarah. Uh, we're open for question and answers. Uh, teachers, if you have any questions, please, you're free to ask. Mm -hmm. I beat the ball into submission. <laughs> Can I ask the question? I take the liberty, liberty to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask if the children have directly come to grade one. And so if they're not using the pupil book, will they be able to, uh, you know, do justice to this? Uh, what the the, um, the pupil book from like the Jolly Phonics from the first year. Um, yes, to be honest with you, most people, particularly if they're doing um, English as a, a foreign or an additional language, probably don't get much beyond two. Um, three actually is quite complex. Uh, I do know people who do grammar one next to pupil book two and grammar two next to pupil book three they they use the two together so there is a lot of overlap and there is a lot of repetition so if you've only done pupil book one and two you're fine to move on to grammar one because actually there is a lot of as i say repetition we go over the digraphs uh we go over um you know the main alternative spellings so so it's perfectly you, you could you could just do pupil book one and actually all the teaching in people books two and three are within this. Is it better for the children if they have a broader and wider experience, but it's perfectly, 
perfectly able to do it. You just need to be aware that you're not revising it, but you're teaching it sometimes. All right. And another thing that I have in my mind is uh, when we do prepositions, and I see that in grade one, we do prepositions of movement directly. So uh, is it not a progression that if we go from uh, prepositions of uh, place and then time, we are missing on time, and then we're just directly coming to prepositions of movement? So are we filling the gap anywhere? Or is it really a gap? Um, um, it, it does come up later on, but actually it probably should be filled in at that point, to be honest. Um, but again, we were starting with the prepositions of place because that's the easiest way to introduce it to the younger children. But it does it does come up um, higher up the grammar. But again, it's slightly different because if you're if you're teaching as a native language, then the children have a certain level of, of knowledge and understanding, which children as an additional foreign language don't. And, you know, because this was written originally uh, for, for use in the UK, it never occurred to us it would go anywhere else. Uh, there are one or two gaps like that in there for that reason, but because we, we don't necessarily need to. <laughs> but yes, you, you do need to sometimes fill in gaps that, uh, that we don't. Right, like so we can fill those gaps with our own um, you know, addition. You know, you, you need, we need to do yeah. an animated work on vocabulary, but not half sure. as much as you need to do. Um, you know, and as I say, that's why you need to work on vocabulary that you're working on. You know, change things, um, you know, like, as I say, with the adjectives, you know, we've done snakes, but if you've got something of another topic doing, you know, as long as they know what an adjective is, then it doesn't matter whether they know whether it applies to a snake or a fish or, you know, you can change it because it's the learning that's important, not the fact that they can tell you that the snake is long, scaly and red. And similarly, if I talk about tenses here, the verb tenses, we're not doing interrogatives and negatives. So do we fill up the gap there too? Again, it's something that goes further up. Um, but again, it, it's a slight difference between a, between a native language and teaching it as a, a foreign or additional language. Um, and again, uh, you know, the, the tenses, the nine tenses, our children will speak in them right from the beginning, but they won't be able to say, oh, that's a present continuous because they, they won't understand what that is. But they will still use these things even without the explicit grammar understanding of it. But, you know, if there's something like that 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 you think your children aren't understanding it needs, then yeah, you know, you're the teacher, the children in front of you are your class and you are the expert on, on them. Um, you know, because some classes, we all know, I mean, you can you can teach the same list to two different classes back to back. One will go swimmingly and one will be terrible, um, but you have to adjust to the class and the situation, um, you know, and all of that comes, comes within that, um, you know, you, you cannot provide one thing that covers the whole world. It would be nice if we could, but so yeah, any, any things like that, you know, fill them in. They, this is where the talking and the listening to stories and the using the stories to do things, that, that's where this comes in because that starts filling in all those um, gaps that are there in terms of you are having to learn an awful lot of other things at the same time, like vocabulary, like comprehension, like understanding. Um, but, but books and stories and rhymes are a great way of doing that. Because again, you know, you're not having to make it up. You can read it out. You're getting the cadences and the construction of the language, which the children absorb. You know, that's how they get language. Um, so I'm, I'm a great believer in, as I say, yeah, you know, not, not just teaching grammar and spelling, but teaching it within the context of books, stories, rhymes, because that's... And of course, making it experiential and uh, the practical yeah. usage, because I understand negatives is not a problem for children, but of course, interrogative questions, I mean, questions, they should know how to, uh, you know, make, especially, of course, if you're not a native speakers, yeah. then they must be taught how to, yeah. All right, thank you so much. So teachers, please, any questions? <laughs> so Sarah, I have a suggestion. I think we should uh, next time have a session for uh, the higher grades for three, four, five, six. Um, um, 
to be honest, I normally, I say one and two are quite similar and go together quite well. Three and yeah. four, and then five and six. I, I sort of, you know, break them up like that. And they, they, work, they work quite well doing them in those sort of packs. I have one question, uh, Sarah. Generally, whenever I go to the schools, they generally ask me why not this grammar book is in compartments. Like, why is it not like noun? And after that, you have a proper noun. And after that, you have, why is it like it's all over the place? Why is it so? Well, it's not all over the place. Uh, <laughs> because, as I say, we build up elements. We build up bit by bit. And we don't, I mean, you know, you've only got so much time within a year group anyway. So you don't want to... Um, you know, we don't want to spend half a, a year in year one learning about nouns and nothing else. They need to get their, their basic building block structure in. And then in the next, um, you know, like they'll start off with proper nouns. Then they'll learn about common nouns. Then they learn about collective nouns. We do have strands that run all the way through, but um, they are introduced to the children at the point that is uh that they need to use them and that um that that they understand uh you know and then we go up you know to to uncountable nouns and things but you know trying to explain an uncountable noun to a, a, a six-year-old is probably you know your life is too short you don't need to be doing it they understand it in a way but but by starting to talk about it quite complex stuff they don't need to know it at that stage so what we do is we say we introduce a little bit at a time and then we keep going back um, you know, like we introduce a proper noun and a common noun. And then um, in a few lessons time, we go back and we then revise what proper or common nouns are and we do something else with them. And actually allows the time for the information to filter into the children's knowledge and understanding. And then we've revised it and we've added a little bit more um, rather than, you know, just doing a big hit and then moving on and doing verbs and then doing something else and prepositions by which time, you know, they've forgotten quite a lot of what you've told them at the beginning of the year about, about nouns and things. You know, it's this idea of, of being holistic and, and winding the learning in and, and connecting it all, um, you know, to each other because, um, you know, sentences don't just have nouns in them. Sentences have all the parts of speech uh, in them or they can do. So we need to be aware of all of them. Um, no, you know not just one part and just teaching one thing and then um, moving on to the next thing um, it, it actually works much better when when you you, you teach it uh, with this sort of you know uh, over, overview going on that you, that you need all these all these things it makes it more interesting yeah thank you Sarah. thank you so teachers you can unmute if you have any questions or you can put it on chat as we close the session. If you have any question. Oh, good evening, sir. Uh, this is Shalini from Huda. Uh, Ma'am, good evening, uh, 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 Jasri Krishna. And uh, actually the thing is, I'm teaching the younger one, the prep students and uh, but they are uh, totally unknown to the phonics because they were not there in the school for two years. After lockdown, they came into the school. Now I'm finding a great trouble to teach them the phonics. What should I do? Um, well, <laughs> I would actually <laughs> teach them. I would teach them the phonics. I would say, you know, not not to worry about um, the grammar one uh, and. Uh, and to worry about the phonics and either, you know, get their phonics up to speed or, um, and then start on the grammar one. Um, if you've got like a group coming into the class and the rest yeah. of the class is already doing it, that's a different matter. Um, this is what we used to have all the time because we would have people come in because they knew we would teach them. So you'd have your class who are quite able and doing everything you've told them to, and you'd have a group that you were starting from the beginning again. But that is basically what you've got to do. Find out what sounds that they do know um, and then build up their knowledge of the ones that they don't know. You know, give them a sound box, give them a sound book, 
you know, they're in the lesson, they're taking on all the things that you're um, saying to them as well, but build up their sound knowledge. And actually, because they're slightly older, because they're in a class where it's all going on, as I say, if you are doing things all the time, like, you know, the sounding out of the words, all that is, is going in and it will fall into place. But, but find out what they do know, add in what they don't know. If you can do that before starting on grammar one, that's great. Because actually, you know, you're only focusing on one thing. And then once you've got that sorted out, you can move quicker on other things. If it's a group that's come in and you will always have some who are weaker, you know, you will always have the whole spectrum of, of children within a class. Um, they say, just just take them out, play times or get if they've got a parent who can help, get them, get them doing those sounds, get them sounding out words, get them doing dictation uh, and, and get their phonics up to speed. Thank you, thank you so much. <coughs> Got here. Um, so I see a question here. What is the rule to read words with letter silence in between? Uh, well, you see, technically it's not silent letters in between. I mean, a word like light, you've got three uh, sounds. You've got oh, 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 pitara, you've got I, which is spelt with a, a trigraph, I-G-H, and the t, so so the igh is forming one sound, um, which they should have learnt. Uh, eight again, you've got two sounds. You've got a t, and the eigh is saying the a. As we're saying, the English language has some very bizarre things in it, but by teaching them in the way that we do, we learn them how to cope with with that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Pronunciation is a bit of a minefield. Um, your pronunciation shouldn't be different from our pronunciation in a way, because we should all be speaking um, with the accent of the, the language. But we have different accents. I mean, there's a difference between accents and pronunciation. We have different accents within the UK, within, you know, Scottish, Welsh. Uh, you, the children learn to cope with them because on the whole, they use the same accent as a teacher. Um, and you do have to... Um, Accents are good. There's nothing wrong with them. They're not a bad thing. Um, by teaching through sound, as I say, we do um, try and get the, the pronunciation to be as clear as possible. But we have differences in pronunciation within, you know, up north they will say fast. We will say fast. Okay. Neither's wrong. Neither's right. And I'm, I'm quite happy and I understand what fast means. And someone from up north will understand what fast means. But, you know, when it comes up, I just explain it to the children. If, if we have things that come up, you know, someone will say to me when we're starting off and we learn about chur, you know, there'll be some child who says, my name's Christopher. That begins with a chur, but it begins with a curse sound. And you say, well, yeah, this is what happens. Um, you know, it can make this sound. And I just explain it to them um, and say that this is this is the way it is. Okay, I'm just trying to read the next one. I want to ask, as we know, when two vowels come walking, it makes a long vowel. The first one speaks its name. That makes quiet. Same likes with magic. E. Eight will be counted as a long vowel. A is a long vowel word because it's got that A sound in it, the long vowel A. A. Yeah. It was a long vowel, won't be short because it's it's got the long vowel sound. It's the sound that's important. As I say, it's ears. It's the ears that are doing our work here. Um, struggling to expect, you just do lots of examples of it, you know, like the one I gave you. If you need to feed them words, you know, just give them a small number of words to start with, and they just choose one of those to put into their sentence. They can read them to each other, see what different sentences are, but just spoon feed them, scaffold them. Um, you know, then do it with different adjectives and adverbs. It is just a question of experience and learning and seeing. And again, reading lovely books that have got lots of um, adverbs and adjectives and whichever, you know, part of speech uh, you are, are learning on. Uh, he and she. <laughs> he is a boy, she is a girl. Uh, and you use them instead of a name. So if it was a boy, to, instead of repeating the name, you would put he. 
And if it's a girl, instead of repeating her name, you put she. Christmas and church. Because uh, Christmas and church, we've borrowed from Greek, from the Greek language. And in the Greek language, the CH says K, say Christopher, choir, church, uh, Christmas. Ch is Anglo-Saxon. Um, but again, it's knowing that the ch can make a ch, k or sh sound and trying it out, but you do have to have that word within your vocabulary. But again, you can look it up in the dictionary and find the pronunciation as well. Uh, the grammar books does not have explanation for the topic. If they miss the class, they may well. Um, no, because we tend to, tend to do direct teaching um, and you have to catch them up by giving them some uh, a little bit of extra help, probably. Uh, but again, as I say, uh, actually, things like the workbooks have um, for Grammar One actually have some more explanation in it than the teacher's book do, because they are designed to be used at home. Um, so they, they have slightly more information than, than the sheets within the handbook do, but they are designed to be taught directly, not, not for the children to do it themselves. How to explain or and er uh, sounds. Um, I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, I think we're done with the questions. And uh, now for more questions, people can write to us. And uh, it's time to say bye. Thank you, Sarah, for a lovely session. And we're looking forward for more sessions from you for three, four, five, six, as you said. <laughs> so I think Abhishek would <laughs> get in touch with you and a planner session for us. Oh, I see. Like she's put it in there. Um, it's actually to do with the schwa, that er uh, and all questions you ask to do with the schwa, mother er, uh, sense or. Uh. Um, when you get it comes at the end of the word, it can distort a bit. And actually, you just have to emphasize it. So you say sense or or doctor. And you just overemphasize it and they learn. Uh, and again, for reluctant speaker, you just make, make your classroom a lovely, comfortable, confident place for the children to, to feel confident to speak in and ask them lots of questions. Get them speaking to each other. Sometimes get them speaking to a puppet. Some people, some children who don't like speaking to a, an adult and other will speak to a puppet or will speak to each other. You know, whatever you can do, but make speaking part of the lesson. You know, so they're not always listening to you. So it is something that happens within class and then they're used to it and they do it. I'll shut up now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. And we look forward for the three, four sessions uh, on the grammar three and four and a separate session to our grammar five and six. So okay. I'll be with you. Thank you so much. Uh, nice to see you all. I hope you've got better weather than we have. <laughs> 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 so it's uh, so we are in north part but uh, if you do go down south it's very pleasant these days so it's... Um, oh that's nice yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've, got, we've got winter woolies on <laughs> it's more uh, tropical there so it's not like over here thank you so much thank you thank see you very you. much nice to see you thank, thank you bye. have a good day bye bye <laughs>